Welcome. My name is Jennifer McKim and I'm a senior investigative reporter at the GBH News Center for Investigative Reporting. I'm also today's moderator. Joining me today are Howard Koh, the Harvard V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Kennedy School, as well as faculty chair of the Initiative on Health and Homelessness at the Harvard Chan School. Jim O'Connell, president of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. Amanda Andiri, CEO of Funders Together to End Homelessness. Margaret Kuschel, Professor of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center, and the Director of the UCSF Benioff Homeless and Housing Initiative. And Roseanne Haggerty, President and Chief Executive Officer of Community Solutions. We're streaming live on the website of the forum. We're also streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. Viewers can submit their questions via email to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. On a single night in January 2019, before the coronavirus pandemic gripped the US, approximately 568,000 people in the country were experiencing homelessness, according to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Now, more than a year later, and with the country marking the grim milestone of surpassing 500,000 COVID deaths, experts are calling for a reckoning with the nation's homeless reality. What are the sources and impacts? How has the pandemic worsened the situation? Who is most at risk and why? And what are the programs and policies that may be able to help? Before we begin, let's watch a short news clip about how eviction is affecting families here in Massachusetts. This clip is shown courtesy of GBH News. This is moving from the uh, family shelter that we were first placed at. Sherry Scalona leafs through files, a fraction of the paperwork, she says, cataloging her family's housing struggles. Nearly a decade ago, they lost their home in the town of Wilmington to foreclosure. We had to get everything packed up, all the children and, and whatnot. And then off to the next place that they wanted to send us. Scalona, her husband Bill DeMoulin, and their seven children still have family photos. But most other belongings were left behind as they moved from one hotel to the next until they couldn't afford it. The state ultimately found them housing in the only available place, more than 100 miles from home in the city of Holyoke. Just uprooted uprooted in here we're taking you from this side of the state and we're plopping you on the other side of the state and you figure it out with an eviction crisis looming and affordable housing in short supply advocates fear many more families will have to be placed farther away from the lifelines of their home communities homelessness and eviction can can spiral a family um, in a way that has really long-lasting repercussions on um, the children the family itself it, it, it's a really destabilizing force and it's hard to climb back just over a year and a half ago Demoulin got a new job as an assistant manager at a gas station and before he got his first paycheck he says the state moved the family from their shelter apartment into a market rate one they got a year of help paying the rent. But soon after that aid ended, the family fell behind and now faces eviction. You know, I'm trying to work as much as I can, but when you're so far behind and being put out over two hours away from your home origin, it just really um, set this family back. In recent years, the state has seen a jump in the number of homeless families. The pandemic is expected to make it worse. Howard, so great to have you here. You had an important initiative on health and homelessness. How did you get involved in this issue and how are the current problems like the pandemic and evictions having particular impacts on homeless right now? Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for moderating. And as I start, I want to express my gratitude to the forum organizers to my four fellow panelists who are such distinguished national leaders, and most importantly, to everyone who is watching, because while homelessness is such a monumental health equity challenge, it's never received the urgent societal attention it deserves. And now with COVID, the risk of homelessness uh, reaches potentially millions more. So we all need to pay attention and commit to responding to this challenge. So Jennifer, with response to your question, 
I, I first became involved in this issue many years ago when I was a Massachusetts commissioner of public health. Uh, one harsh winter back then, almost a dozen homeless people froze to death on the streets of Boston. And each death was so public and in plain sight for all to see. And this was, of course, a terrible chapter in the history of our city and state. The public was horrified. The press covered each death closely and the advocates were justifiably enraged and demanded a response from government. So back then as commissioner, I convened an emergency statewide task force that met regularly with a specific goal of preventing deaths on the street. Uh, we ended up meeting uh, over several years in fact, and I would like to think that we coordinated services a bit better and helped people a little bit and made some kind of a difference but the single most important thing I remember from that experience was that I was fortunate to ask my lifelong colleague, Dr. Jim O'Connell, who's on this panel today, to start each of those meetings with comments on each person who had died, because it was assumed that the people who died were unknown and people who are homeless are regularly viewed as faceless and nameless. But to our surprise, we found that each person who died was well known to Dr. Jim and his colleagues at the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. Jim started each meeting describing each person who died, uh, who they were, their hopes, their dreams, their struggles, their disappointments. And he brought so much needed humanity into the discussion from day one. So I remember that so clearly. Uh, later, when I was Assistant Secretary for Health, in DC at the US Department of Health and, Service, Health and Human Services, I learned much more about what the federal government is trying to do to coordinate addressing homelessness through the US Interagency Council on Homelessness, which brings together all 19 federal agencies. And I was also pleased to see that HHS now funds over 300 dedicated healthcare for the homeless programs across the country. But the need keeps rising, particularly through COVID. Um, I often think of my colleague, the, rate, the late, Reverend William Sloan Coffin, who once said, we should care most about those society counted least and put last. So right now, why are people homeless? Who are they and why is it getting worse? At the very basic level, people become homeless because they are unable to access affordable housing with affordability defined as housing payments not exceeding 30% of household income. But that very simple statement has so many complicated dimensions as you're gonna to hear today from my fellow panelists. There are individual factors such as poverty and sudden job loss, uh, mental illness, displacement after physical abuse or family conflict. There are societal factors like our steadily rising rents and housing markets and now of course the devastation of COVID. And then we should all recognize that homeless people represent a heterogeneous population. Some are families, some are individual adults, some are veterans, some are youth. Uh, many suffer from mental health and substance use conditions, um, an area I've learned so much about from one of my best teachers, my daughter, Dr. Katie Coe, who's a street psychiatrist for Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. Many are people of color and those of LGBT background. Uh, many are acutely homeless and some are chronically homeless and living on the street, but all are stigmatized and regularly dehumanized. So right now, COVID has brought all these themes into sharp relief. Uh, even before COVID, it was estimated that some 11 million households pay over half their income on housing. That's well past the 30% threshold I mentioned earlier. Now through COVID at the federal level, uh, level there's a eviction moratorium established last year that's been extended by the Biden administration and the CDC until the end of March, but we have to watch that closely. Enforcement has been spotty and the eviction lab at Princeton notes that some 250,000 evictions have already occurred in some five states being tracked. There's a foreclosure moratorium for some 2.7 million homeowners who can't pay their mortgages. That's been extend extended to the end of June. So all these developments bring us to this week where the house is debating the president's $1.9 trillion COVID relief package. If you look at it, there is included a section addressing housing assistance for some $30 billion directed to rental assistance and some $5 billion to help those who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. So we need to follow this carefully through the House this week, through the Senate next week and beyond. And doing this work will involve not just government, but the medical community, 
colleagues from the worlds of housing, criminal justice, shelters, business law, faith-based organizations, and so many others. So later on the program, Jennifer, I can say a little bit more about our new initiative at our school that tries to address some of these issues as an academic community. So thank you so much. Great. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing about it. It sounds very exciting. We're going to move directly to Jim. Jim, you spent more than 35 years delivering medical care to people who are experiencing homelessness, and we really thank you for your service. We're hoping you can tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing right now. Sure, and um, let me add my thanks to all of you for uh, inviting us here, particularly to Dr. Ko for that nice introduction. Uh, and I'm uh, kind of thrilled to one, I've just recently met Amanda, but I am like old, old friends with both Roseanne and Margot, and it's an honor to be here with you two who uh, see the world from a much higher perspective than I've been able to. So um, I would <clears throat> offer this. So I'm in our healthcare for the homeless program here in Boston has been working hard sort of at the ground level um, to cope with uh, COVID as it's hit the shelters. And as you all know well, um, we um, in Boston, about 90% of our adults are in shelters, about 10% are out in the streets and virtually all of our families are in shelters. So when the virus was coming our way, uh, we panicked a little bit about how uh, virulent it was likely to be inside the closed and crowded shelters. And not surprisingly, about 40% of all the adults living in shelters in Boston came down with COVID. And what we had to realize, come to realize is, you know, we have clinics in about you know, 25, 26 shelters around um, Boston, most of the adult and family shelters. We have clinics uh, at the hospital, um, both at Mass General and at Boston Medical Center. And we have a 104-bed respite program, where, which we've been developing for many years with the help of a lot of partners. But we realized we were full and absolutely crazy busy as COVID came on. And then when COVID hit us, we had to completely turn everything upside down as many of you have done the same. We had no place, for example, to isolate or quarantine people when they were exposed or had the virus. Um, and so I remember our staff who have been unbelievably wonderful and I can't believe they still have any energy left at all. We put up tents for quarantining. You know, we helped the mayor helped us get extra places so that the shelters who have been great partners were able to go from five or 600 people down to 200 people to make sure that the virus, um, they could do some distancing. And then we also um, opened a um, hospital with the help of Mass General Brigham opened uh, and the mayor opened the Boston Convention Center, we had 500 beds aside and right next to a 500 bed hospital run by Mass General, uh, where we could take people with COVID uh, who from the shelters or who had, were living in very poor situations. So that was the original thing back in March, in April and May, and we were pretty overwhelmed. Um, but thankfully that that first wave went away um, and we had a somewhat quiet summer and then in the fall it all came back again. And what we had to do is gear up and do it again. And we realized there's a certain um, emotional and physical exhaustion that comes with that as you try to cope with what's going on. Um, but there's been a ray of hope recently. And just to frame shift onto that, what we have now can do is vaccinate. And the Mass Massachusetts, as many of you know, put people living in congregate sh shelters up high on the list in the, in the category one. So we've been now... Uh, not only trying to take care of the people who have COVID in this current wave, which is well, thankfully going away, but also beginning to vac vaccinate people. So using our network of clinics and all the shelters, uh, we've vaccinated about 50% of everybody who lives in shelters now, at least the first shot. <laughs> and as all of you know, finding everybody for the second shot is gonna be the next uh, real challenge. And I think we have about, you know, of the sort of, there's been about 1,800 people who have gotten their vaccinations, a combination of staff and guests. I think we've gotten about 400 of them to their second doses so far, and we'll see how we do going forward. And that remains to be seen. But it is a ray of hope. Um, and we are really hopeful at this point that maybe things will begin to get a little bit better as the number of people who have been uh, have had the virus and those who have now been vaccinated begins to increase our protection and immunity against future stuff. But let me leave it at there. I just would share with everybody that it's um, it's been an exhausting time. And what I worry about really intensely is all the stuff we cannot do when we're doing COVID focused activity. And when I think of all of our folks with cancer and diabetes and you know COPD and or lung disease, 
all of those people that used to be our everyday life, we've had to really um, ameliorate our services in order to take care of COVID, which was the immediate threat. So I'll be interested to hear everybody else's experience in that. But let me stop here and just say I'm thrilled to be here and hope that perspective isn't too local. <laughs> No, thank you so much, Jim. And ray of hope is something we're all really eager to hear right now after this long, dark period of time. Uh, Amanda, we'd love to hear from you and about your great work as the CEO at Funders Together to End Homelessness. Um, you speak about homelessness through a critical lens of racial and social justice, and we're hoping to hear more about that. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Amanda Andiri. I am in Northern Virginia, right outside of DC on the stolen indigenous land of the Monahawk tribe. I wanna begin actually by acknowledging that this is still Black History Month. And for me, it's Black Futures Month, a time to acknowledge our history so we can plan for a future of a liberated state. If we want to end homelessness, uh, and I think the only way we actually can end homelessness is through a racial and housing justice lens. It actually has to start by having panels and discussions like these that look a lot different. I know I was invited to join by my colleague and partner and friend, actually, Margot, who insisted this panel be more diverse. And frankly, it is the responsibility of all white leaders in our movement to give up power and ensure panels like these represent the diverse leaders who have been crying out for racial justice. Leaders with lived expertise of homelessness. Panels like these dis discussions around housing and homelessness in the future should be majority black and native American people and people with lived expertise of homelessness. As you mentioned, this uh, has been the work of Funders Together to End Homelessness. We are a network of philanthropy that in 2019 uh, lifted up five years worth of work to make eight commitments and four aspirations towards racial equity. We've since moved to an organization that's thinking about what it means to be anti-racist, um, what it means to center racial justice, and eventually what it means to be pro-Black, pro-Indigenous, pro-LGBTQ, as well as being anti-racist in our policy and practices. So uh, what we know in a time of crisis, especially during uh, this pandemic, is that COVID-19 is not and never was the great equalizer. In fact, it has only exasperated the structural inequities that already exist. We know that Black, Native American, and Latinx communities have been uh, disproportionately impacted by the, uh, those disparities in, in the virus. And these disparities we're seeing are rooted in structural racism and are not about race. This is not about pre-existing conditions. It's about pre-existing inequities from stolen indigenous land and chattel slavery. As Race Forward reminds us, COVID-19 kills and structural racism is its accomplice. And we have seen that actually for years in the homelessness system. Um, I could go into a lot of data, but we know that disproportionately black people, for example, are 13% of the general population, but account for over 40% of those who experience homelessness. And we see those same disparities in American Indian and Alaska Native individuals. And even when we control for poverty, we see those same disparities. So we can't um, minimalize these disparities to think it's about economics or about location or geography. We know it's because of government sanctioned racism and years of disinvestment in housing justice. Um, we see these even with when we look at the disparities around LGBTQ youth and the disproportionality in black and brown youth who experience homelessness. Uh, so I hope today we can get into discussion about uh, the, the only way to end homelessness is actually to address structural racism. What does it mean to, uh, as a part of racial equity, to be diverse and inclusive in these conversations and how we get to uh, housing justice? Amanda, thank you so much. I'm so glad you decided to come and your voice is so important to this conversation. So thank you so much. Um, the next person we're gonna hear about is, from is Margot from the Benioff Homeless and Housing Initiative. And we're really uh, looking forward to hearing about some of your research there. Wonderful, thank you so much um, for inviting me. So I'm Margot Cuchel and I'm at UCSF where I direct uh, the Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. 
where we agree a thousand percent with my friend and colleague, Amanda, that we cannot address homelessness without centering racial justice and without being honest about the ongoing effects of structural racism in our society. When we founded the BHHI last year, we founded it with the goal of translating the evidence-based about ways to prevent and end homelessness into policies and practices and to fill the gaps where there were questions. So we try to do things a little differently than traditional academics. We use a method called strategic science in which we're in constant communication with what we call our end users. So impacted communities, members of impacted communities, policymakers, nonprofits, health systems, everyone sort of engaged in this problem, housers, to find out what questions they still have and to work to translate those questions into research questions and to deploy those answers um, to those questions and circulate the responses back. We're also constantly trying to lift up the evidence base and to acknowledge we basically know what to do. The problem is more that we haven't um, done it. We like to say that we're trying to influence the three Ps, policies, programs, and perspectives, because until we change the hearts and minds of most Americans, the policymakers are not gonna be able to get out in front of that. During COVID, our work shifted dramatically. And so one advantage of strategic science is that we're sort of ready to switch to see what needs to be done in the moment. So um, in the first weeks of the shutdown, you know, even before, um, before the shutdown happened by, you know, December, January, we were already worried about this. We were planning with our health departments and with the housing system, particularly in California, about what to do. Um, as soon as the shutdown happened in California, in the Bay Area, we were, um, I think, the first place to shut down in the country. Um, I was deployed to the um, State Operations Center, where over the course of two sleepless days, we came up with a program which became uh, Project Room Key, where we used um, hotel rooms, which were newly emptied because of the lack of tourism, to move people experiencing homelessness to safety out of congregate settings and out of unsheltered settings. Um, we applied to FEMA and we're the first in the nation to get a FEMA waiver. And by the way, this is the first time that FEMA has provided housing funds for people who are homeless during a national disaster. That program has become a national model, both where we move people at high risk of serious complications of COVID to stay in the hotel rooms um, throughout the pandemic, um, but also people who are in crowded housing or otherwise can't be safe, who um, are experiencing mild COVID symptoms or who have been exposed. We've done a lot of work trying to um, bring testing to homeless communities. We're right now doing rapid testing in every shelter in San Francisco, and we've done large outreach measures to people throughout uh, in unsheltered settings. And um, we are not as lucky as Massachusetts, despite our efforts. We cannot get um, California to prioritize people in congregate settings, um, but we are doing a lot of work on vaccinations. Um, when we think, think about structural racism, one of the ways that that plays out is in in our country's shameful lack of extremely low-income housing. This means housing that's affordable and available to families or households who make less than 30% of the area median income. Make no mistake, the reason we don't have this housing has everything to do with our nation's um, racism. Right now in our country, there are only 36 units of housing available and affordable for every 100 ELI household. In California, we're the second worst in the nation with only 23 units. We can't end homelessness by simply plucking people who are homeless out of homeless situations and putting them in housing. We've got to get to the root of the problem. Finally, I just want to mention, as I'm the only West Coaster, I think, on this panel, is that people will often think that homelessness in California is sort of worse than in, in other parts of the country. I'm from New York. People, when I ask people, where is it worse, New York or San Francisco, everyone raises their hand and says San Francisco. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm proud of how it is in San Francisco because it's horrible, but just a reminder that actually in New York it has a higher prevalence of homelessness than San Francisco does. New York has a right to shelter, such that only 5% of people who are homeless in New York are unsheltered, whereas in California, about two thirds of people are unsheltered and thus more visible. Unsheltered homelessness is horrible and dangerous, but make no mistake, the answer to homeless is not simply warehousing people in shelters where mostly black, brown, indigenous people are out of sight and out of mind, but suffering horribly. And so to answer, to end homelessness, we need to be you know, talking about racial justice, housing justice, a right to housing, and not merely a right to shelter. So maybe I'll stop there and turn the mic back.
That is so important. And we're going to be discussing that more along today. So I really appreciate you bringing up those really important topics. Roseanne, um, sometimes people make the mistake of viewing homelessness as a personal failure. And as we've been hearing, clearly that's not the issue. Um, Can you talk about Built for Zero and why it's using data to inform policy and programs related to homelessness? Thank you, Jennifer. It's an honor to be here with uh, the the wonderful group here in this important conversation. Uh, Built for Zero, uh, an initiative of Community Solutions, takes a public health approach to homelessness, and we work currently with 84 city and county regions across the country, really communities of every type, every politics. And uh, by a public health model, uh, I mean, we have come to see that homelessness is uh, basically a complex systems problem. It's not, as you, you know, just Uh, and everyone has pointed out, it's not about individual failure, it's about system failure, it's about choices, uh, you know, historic racism that has has really created a landscape that we must actually uh, uh, work differently on this problem. And with a public health model, what we mean by that is we have uh, focused in our communities on a population level outcome. We have worked on getting uh, across the community the right team of all of the key players who have uh, resources, information, uh, uh, rule control, um, to actually focus on the aim of reducing homelessness. We saw uh, after really 20 years of being a very prolific builder of affordable and supportive housing, that the absence of an operating system that actually connected everyone's uh, efforts and that was accountable to each person and getting uh, that that individual or, or family housed was equally important to having uh, an adequate supply of, of housing. And so Built for Zero has um, essentially mobilized uh, uh, some of the techniques that have led to Uh, such enormous progress in um, uh, uh, disease eradication and everything related, uh, reductions in traffic safety, uh, fatalities, and and, and what have you. And what we um, teach communities to do is five things differently. One, to define the problem as a complex problem that requires a dynamic and collective and collaborative response. Uh, Two, to have that right team together, that everybody is working toward a community and population level end state as opposed to simply the operations of their own program and staying in compliance with funding rules. Three, um, to have the right data. Uh, This is essential for uh, assuring uh, racial equity in our systems. Uh, As long as uh, uh, this problem is not understood at the personal and at the the, uh, community level, it's it's too easy to escape accountability for the racial disparities in our system. And it's uh, it's too hidden and unable, we're unable to take action on them to make them more equitable. And so uh, Built for Zero communities um, are, are, are collecting by name, real-time information, and essentially can look at this problem dynamically and apply their resources in, in, um, in rapid and uh, kind of quickly tested ways. Um, a third is the idea of having the right aim. The only thing that really counts at the end of the day, are, are we reducing homelessness in a sustainable way? Uh, that, that, that has to transcend, do we have good programs? Is it all adding up to fewer people experiencing homelessness and is it allowing us this collective activity to work more and more toward prevention and putting our resources into the long-term structural fixes that uh, my, my fellow panelists have described? And then lastly, you know, housing is so essential, but it's very rarely the case that communities housing or zoning or other policies actually are lined up with an aim of ending homelessness or or to achieve those equitable goals. And so what we have seen as a necessary, a new kind of approach to housing supply is to link all of these things together and to fill housing gaps with um, with other than the single program that the country has, you know, so we are using social impact capital to do that. And during COVID, I'll just uh, finish by saying, all of this has accelerated. We uh, have seen the importance of communities having accurate data, of being organized as a team, uh, knowing that the task is is reducing those uh, who are at risk, uh, not just of, of the consequences of homelessness, but now of, of, uh, of COVID. And we have seen steady progress and uh, communities in our network being very well positioned to use new federal resources because they are organized, because they know their data, because they see where new investment can actually drive reductions. Uh, So I'll stop there. 
as an investigative reporter, just saying the word data gets me very excited. I'm really glad that that is part of the conversation. Um, this has been really be great beginning um, of the process, learning about everybody. Before we head into deeper discussion, we're going to remind the audience that this is the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, presented jointly with GBH News. Viewers can post their questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. And before we begin the next part of our discussion, let's watch a short clip about a critical aspect of homelessness that we've touched on uh, very poignantly, the disproportionate impact on Black and Native Americans. This clip is shown courtesy of the National Racial Equity Working Group. A society can be judged by how it treats its most vulnerable members. Look around. As a nation, who does America allow to become homeless? And what does that say about us? Black and Native Americans are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. It is no accident. For generations, people of color have been denied access to everything at the heart of a just and fair society, including a place to call home. People burdened most by these inequities are more likely to be met by a punitive system instead of a social safety net. And when they do become homeless, the systems that respond to homelessness often do a better job of supporting people who are white than those who are not. Homelessness is a mirror. It reflects our nation's living history of racism. It also reflects the stark reality that these are life and death issues. Uh, really important topic. And now um, we'd like to focus more on, uh, Amanda, what you brought up so importantly is the issues of race uh, related to homelessness. So we want to leave it to uh, Amanda and Roseanne to talk about uh, more of this important topic. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Thank um, you. And I'll just frame, I think there's actually a few things that we should be thinking about when it comes to racial and housing justice and understanding how that's different than equity. Uh, equity really gets at disparities, right? So what many of you mentioned, looking at data in our system, looking at the disparities and not trying to get to parity or equality. We've had an equality framework in, our, in a lot of our human services and housing systems, but really looking at equity. So actually giving people what they need, what they want, at a proportion um, that looks at the historical impact of structural racism. But justice really gets to power. Uh, and that's what makes people really feel uncomfortable, but that's, you know, we've come to this uh, overdue awakening around racism in our country um, because we saw two black men being lynched publicly on TV last year. Um, we acknowledge the death of Ahmaud Arbery uh, just yesterday, um, a year since his public lynching. And so we have to take that energy, um, that reckoning, and actually do something with this, with it to make us feel uncomfortable so we can move to a justice frame. So just a few points around that. Data is super critical, and I applaud especially our partners, Community Solutions, for their work around data and how they're also starting to go deep into communities around racial equity. But we, we have to recognize that, uh, particularly for black and brown communities, we've been over-researched and over-studied. And there's a point where we can look at the data and then we can just believe black and brown people <laughs> and give them what they want and what they need um, and do that in concert with data, but also realize that communities have been saying that there has been these disparities for years. And it's a part of our white supremacy culture to actually over-research um, and not just believe people. And that goes to my point about the difference between equity and justice. For years uh, working in direct service, uh, a lot of our solutions to ending homelessness was just moving people into the next affordable community, the next affordable neighborhood. But what we have to look at is giving people agency over where they live and how they live. Um, and when we move them away from community, move them away from family, move them away from the things that will uh, give them power and agency over their lives, are we really doing them any justice? Um, so yes, the solution uh, to ending homelessness is getting someone into a home, but, but does that really equal community? And so we have to think about that. 
We also have to dismantle the idea that success in housing or in anything actually is proximity to whiteness. Um, we often talk about like uh, moving people to opportunity neighborhoods. I don't know what that means because black neighborhoods have tons of opportunity and prosperity when people actually invest in them and give them power and move out of the way. Out of the way. So, um, uh, we need to dismantle that idea that the only success is when people move into a neighborhood that's usually predominantly white. We need to decolonize gatekeepers who hold power. That's including myself, people in philanthropy, everyone on this panel, you are a gatekeeper. You hold power and resources. And the goal of justice is to get resources in community and not be held by any one entity or organization. That's your political power, your actual money, your ability to influence policymakers. Move out of the way. Um, and finally, we have had an incremental approach to housing and ending homelessness in this country. And I feel like we're, we're at the precipice of a breakthrough where we can look at actually how do we explore things like defunding the carceral system to achieve community safety through housing. We need big investments um, that look at structures that do look at systems change, but we can't just rely on this incremental approach to housing and have to think about housing justice through housing as um, an entitlement, as a right through universal housing. Um, and that's the way that I think we'll actually get to big change. Uh, such important topics. I'm gonna actually, you, you really brought up this issue that I've been hearing all the way along through this, which is the issue is homeless, is housing the solution? And as a journalist over decades of writing about this topic, I've heard that so often, and I think we should explore it more. Jim, can you talk a little bit about that? How you feel about, you know, what people say, if we just give them homes, that will that will be the answer? I think that, that you, we will never solve homelessness without housing and without a you know, a just housing system, a right to housing um, and respecting it, well, all that everybody said. I think our experience, if you look at just the people currently out there, housing is, you know, sufficient, but not, I mean, it's necessary, but maybe not sufficient. And we're struggling now. Um, we, we follow a lot of our street folks who've been out there for many years, get placed in housing. And while the, um, um, resonating with what Amanda is saying, we frequently put them in neighborhoods where they where they do not have community and they don't have what they really need. Um, and then we judge success about whether they stay there or not. Um, and we're finding that they, where if you, if you step back, people tend to do really well for about a year or maybe two years. But if you start to look at what happens after three years and five years and even 10 years, you start to see a huge erosion back to homelessness. So that many of our I think many of the things we're still missing and we don't understand is what is it that they need, people need for a community? How do we break down the racial structures that are really boxing people in? Um, how do we address the poverty and the poor schools and the, you know, the blighted neighborhoods where the most affordable housing is currently? So I think we have a big, uh, long way to go in learning how to sustain housing as the solution. Um, and that requires it requires a whole bunch of varied and very flexible supports, much of which I think are going to emerge from the studies and the data that people are looking at now. Um, we, um, you know, when, when we look at, and this is common around the thing, we find that people moving into housing from long-term homelessness, you know, their, their mortality rate after five years is about 50%. It's higher than when they're on the street. So housing is really important, but it's, we need more and we need to be focused on that. I only get nervous when they when we say housing is a solution, <laughs> which I, I wanna say, of course it is, but please don't leave out the supports and the changing of the communities and the investments we need to do and other things to make sure that housing does work. So important. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more, Howard, about the homeless, uh, health and homelessness initiative that, that you are working on at Harvard. Sure, Jennifer. So over the years, uh, despite the major public health challenge that uh, homelessness presents, uh, we've seen very few academic centers that have any dedicated programs or initiatives to uh, address these challenges. And so at our school in particular, there are many students who are interested in these issues, but they had few educational opportunities. Uh, we didn't have a course on health and homelessness. It's not clear how many other schools uh, even have such courses. Uh, any junior faculty who wants to 
do research in this area have a few mentors and uh, very few funding opportunities. Uh, we looked around the country to see if others were doing more and we saw Margot's great initiative at UCSF and we're looking forward to partnering even more closely with Margot uh, who's doing such a great job in, in California. And then just over a year ago, uh, we were very fortunate to receive uh, some help from several generous supporters so that we were able to launch this pilot initiative on health and homelessness at our Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And our mission is to build an academic community that um, brings attention to these issues through education, research, translation, and communication. We're still very early. Uh, we are very pleased and gratified by the response we received from our school community and beyond. Uh, I wanna express ex special thanks to our steering committee that meets monthly that now includes not only Jim, but also uh, Karen Emmons, Nancy Turnbull, Kirk Vanda, Julie Bogdansky, Ruslan Nikitin. Uh, we have a wonderful initiative program manager, Emily Lazovi, who is our go-to person on this initiative day in and day out. Uh, we sponsor monthly educational seminars. It's very well attended by the students and it's switched over to Zoom through the COVID era. Uh, we have a monthly newsletter. Uh, we've put together a theoretical framework for a research roadmap uh, led by Karen Emmons, Henning T. Meyer, and Richard Frank. Uh, we're about to launch the first ever course on health and homelessness at our school next, next month. And that's gonna be co-taught by Drs. Maggie Sullivan and Jill Ron Karate. And we've begun to fund some pilot SPARK grants for graduate students and junior faculty. So this is just a start. Uh, our goal is to build as many partnerships as possible across our school to begin with, across our university, across the country. Uh, we view this forum as a, another milestone because, because of, uh, the initiative has allowed us to reach out to all of the fellow panelists here. And we're very, very grateful to that. And so we hope this is uh, some contribution from academia uh, at a critical time, but much more is needed. And we are eager to hear from anyone who wants to partner with us. So thank you so much, Jennifer. It's great to be here. I'm thinking of so many more stories that I want to uh, get to when I get out of this meeting. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about funding and Roseanne, I wanted to start with you uh, talking about uh, dealing with resolving these problems. Well, uh, it's a scandal that nationally we're spending more than $12 billion on a broken reactive system. And uh, I think job number one, in addition to all of the, uh, the, the imperative that you've heard here, is to uh, get to work spending the money that we're putting into this issue in, in ways that actually deliver results for people who are suffering. Uh, that's why having very clear goals at a community level moving beyond programs to what is it we want for people. We don't want people to be experiencing homelessness and pulling together, and this is really a, an accountability challenge more than it's a money challenge, pulling together that intention at the community level to know everyone by name, to work toward outcomes and to continue working until we are not seeing people experiencing homelessness. This is not an unwinnable fight. Uh, it's, it's while there are 568,000 people, as you quoted, at least um, uh, experiencing homelessness on a given night and 568,000 people too many. This represents less than a fraction of 1% of our population. This part of housing insecurity and housing injustice, we can solve. And it's uh, homelessness is such a powerful way into all of the questions and all of the issues that uh, people have spoken to today um, and, and uh, getting our systems right, taking responsibility and accountability for, for a just resolution to this issue by using the money we have in ways that get results is part one. Fortunately, I think in the new administration, there's going to be much more attention to the range of issues that are manifest in homelessness. But let's not delude ourselves that we can't make progress until you know we have all of the money in the world or all the housing we need. There is an awful lot actually in communities that could be spent and organized much more powerfully. And uh, we're seeing that that's possible when communities are organized differently and are really accountable to what's happening in real time to real people and, and, and not you know, uh, yeah, just uh, getting overwhelmed by numbers. 
I think, uh, thank you so much, because I think it can feel really, really overwhelming when you look at the 10 cities and San Francisco, et cetera. Actually, Margo, can you talk a little bit more about that funding and solutions? Yeah, I mean, I think Amanda hit it on the head, right? We need to we need to put the funding and the power to to the people who have been disproportionately impacted by these policies um, that have led to this crisis. I think I'm always struck by the fact that we will pay a hundred dollars a night to put someone in a shelter, but we won't hand families, you know thousand dollars a month to house their loved ones or or house or give it to the person themselves and so i think part of the thing is you know everyone was um sort of aghast at this uh, study in vancouver bc that showed if you gave people who were homeless cash turns out they weren't homeless anymore and they did a lot better and i think that gets to something that makes americans very uncomfortable but is basically the solution here right we need to we need to give the money to the people who need it. And that's often giving it to black communities, brown communities who can, you know, who can house our loved ones. We seem all too comfortable with giving money to sort of service providers, but not actually to giving it to the people who need it. We need to reinvest in housing in this country. We, you know, people are often not aware, for instance, for rental housing, rental assistance, that not only is it very hard to qualify for it, many people who need it don't qualify, it can be hard to use it, but frankly, only one in four households who meet the strict criteria get any rental assistance. But we also need to rebuild and reinvest in the housing infrastructure. But we also just need to give people the resources that they need to end homelessness. There are, um, yes, there are people who have disabilities. I like to think of the supports that Jim talked about as a disability accommodation. You know, most people who are homeless don't need these services, but often the people who need these services sort of capture the public attention most, they use the most resources, they sort of are the people people notice on the street. And so what I like to say is everybody needs housing they can afford, and that's partially by lowering the cost of housing or increasing people's household income so that they can afford the housing. Some people with disabilities, often mental health or substance use disabilities, need um, support to help them stay in that housing. And for me, those are just disability accommodations in the same way um, as I'm a person with a physical disability and often use wheelchair ramps and elevators, having supports for someone with mental health or substance use to help them live in that housing is in some ways a disability accommodation to that. But basically, we need to move the power and the money to the communities who need it. We need to reinvest in our housing infrastructure, and we need to refund things like um, housing vouchers. And then we need to make sure that fair housing laws and things are aggressively supported so that people can actually use those resources to live wherever it is that they want to live. Um, so that's what I would recommend. Great. Thank you so much. I'd like to move it back to Amanda. We've talked a lot, um, Howard talked about partnerships, and I'd like to hear more in terms of solutions about where we need, we need to go. Yeah, actually, I just want to address something that's been brought in the room that I think is really important. This this, this narrative around housing is the solution. I think as, as my colleague Margo was just saying, we need to be super careful about the nuances around that because the public then still hears, okay, this is a people problem, not a systems and a structure problem. Uh, and I think we all know people in our lives um, who need access to services, whether that's mental health and otherwise, who are housed um, in my family, in my friend circle are housed because they have the income for housing and the income to access services. Uh, so yes, the problem is deeper than housing, but I just want us to be really careful, especially when we talk about a disproportionate amount of people experiencing homelessness being black and brown. We tend to in our country when we say, oh, that housing is not a solution, then default to needing to fix people, that it's their problem and don't uh, acknowledge the structural racist uh, policies um, that have brought people to the position that they're in. And so I think part of what we work on with philanthropy is doing exactly that, is funding like the narrative around homelessness. Like, why is it happening in our country? What are the solutions? 
who needs to be speaking about this. So um, we have a political and public will problem. Um, as Roseanne uh, mentioned, it's not just about a resource problem problem. We actually have the money to, to solve some of these problems in some communities, right? In an, in an incremental or, or um, an immediate way. But the political will has to do with the changing narrative that happens around what actually will solve homelessness. And we need to be really careful and clear about that. Um, I think philanthropy has a particular role in um, innovation on the ground. Um, I do think that the solution to ending homelessness cannot be done uh, through private dollars alone. We need big public investments, but philanthropy has traditionally shown that it can innovate with some of our partners and test um, things on the ground to show uh, what is possible with racial equity and racial justice uh, by giving communities the capacity and the resource to examine the racialized history of, of their own communities and develop solutions um, that uh, dismantle some of those systems. So that's the partnership that needs to happen. Um, but ultimately, uh, the, I think the role of, of, of ending our housing crisis is a role of, of public entities in partnership with private entities. So uh, important. Um, I, as we're talking so much about, about this issue, it is so important that we talk about the actual human beings who are suffering and at risk. And uh, Jim, I'd like to throw it to you for a second to talk more about, uh, again, as we discuss all the policy issues, how we don't forget the people that we're talking about and, and um, the, the problems of the moment. You know, I... Um... I, wor I worry a lot. First of all, the, the richness of this discussion gives everyone, I hope, a flavor for how complicated and how urgent this addressing this issue is. One narrow perspective that I would share is I know, for example, of the people living in the streets of Boston that we're taking care of now. It's going to be if we're really good, it's going to be five or 10 years before we get them housed. We just can't create the housing fast enough. So the question that comes up to the clinicians caring for them is how do you take good care of somebody when you don't have the tools? You know, how do you how do you minimize the tragedy? You know, I was on call this weekend, um, and we had thirty nine people of our folks in the hospital, you know, and when I was thinking about it, only one was in the hospital because of COVID. The rest had cancer. Um, they were newly diagnosed HIV, which is white, coming right through our programs right now. Um, people that are, um, we had seven people in the emergency room uh, being committed for mental health issues, and they all languished for the entire weekend in the emergency room because there are no beds for them to be taken care of. So there's kind of a, you know, there's the upstream issue, which is really critical, but then there's also what do you do with care? How do you care for people and minimize suffering as we're going along? And we sort of struggle by, between going back and forth between those two things. Um, and Margo, I completely agree. These are people with disabilities for the large, large amount. Because if you think about who's being placed in, by the way, of when I looked at those people in the in the hospital, about half of them were in supportive housing now and are in the hospital with continued medical problems. But um, the the issue is that we've been since housing has been so rare, the people who are getting in that through these crazy systems are those who have the most disabilities. So those are the people getting into housing right now. Um, and they obviously need the most support. Um, our program, by the way, I just wanted to share with you was um, mandated to have homeless people. In fact, they told us how we needed to look and what our framework were and they're on our board of directors. So what we do is primarily what they tell us to do. <laughs> and one of the things that they ask for um, and these are people who have been homeless for long periods of time, many of them, they want continuity of care in their system. They want people to stick with them over time. Um, and so the challenge that we've had is how do you set up a system where you can stay with somebody through street, you know, through the hospital, into housing, or wherever it's going. And that's kind of dictated where we're coming from. And that's why we see the struggles that people have. And it is so clear to me that there is a huge investment in housing that needs to be done. We have no extremely low income housing available that I can put my finger on. Um, and it's going to require billions, if not trillions of dollars of putting into housing that I think we have to push the federal government to do. At the same time, I want to say we don't have any mental health care for the people that are out there right now. 
So how do we balance those two is one of the questions I would throw out so that we can take care of people. You know, you're uh, bringing up, um, this is now time to look at some of the questions that we've received. We have very little time, but one of them actually says, we haven't talked much about mental health issues in the homeless population. How do we protect these particularly vulnerable populations? I'm wondering uh, who would like to speak on, on this topic? Amanda? Well, I just wanna say really quickly, we don't have enough mental health care period. Exactly. And we don't have enough mental health care that is um, considerate of Black and Brown and Native populations. Um, just like our homelessness structures, our mental health structures are rooted in structural racism. They have extreme bias. Black and Brown people don't often access mental health, not because of money, but because they don't have providers that look like them that understand their unique experiences. That includes me, in my very um, wealthy home in Northern Virginia. So this is not just a poverty problem. This is actually like a bias and disparity problem. Um, it took me years to find a therapist who was black and a woman and who understood me. So our mental health system is broken, period. And I like respect and agree, and agree with my colleague, Jim, like there's so many supports that we need to fix for people who are housed and people who will be housed um, in the future. Roseanne, you had something to say? Uh, only to, to concur and that, uh, you know, we estimate that what, 20 to 25 percent of those experiencing homelessness also have a serious mental illness, which cannot be improved, cannot be treated effectively without housing. And so you know, just homelessness and housing justice cuts across so many vital issues that affect our most vulnerable neighbors, that affect all of our families, frankly. Right. It's so tied together all of it when you... <laughs> I think it's, it's also super important to say, you know, that mental health system is profoundly broken, but I don't want people to come away from this thinking that because people have a mental health disability, they can't be housed. We know, given the appropriate supports, which means housing and culturally appropriate, you know, available mental health services, they absolutely can be housed. And I think I hear again and again, things like homelessness is because we close the mental hospitals, not warehousing people because they have a disability was the right thing to do and remains the right thing to do. But what we do need to have is the housing and the appropriate support so that people can thrive in the community. Because I'm afraid if we don't name that, people go back. And, and one of the most common conversations I have with policymakers is things like conservatorship or, you know, people say to me, oh, it's because they close the mental hospitals. People deserve to live in the community in the least restrictive environments. And in fact, we know through evidence that they actually can and can thrive that way. I think you guys are all fantastically amazing at sort of smashing the myths that so many people hear. So I really appreciate it. Uh, what time for one more question from Liam from Medill Reports in Chicago. What are the ramifications of or some equity impacts of prioritizing certain groups, such as those 65 and older or essential workers over those experiencing homelessness? Anybody want to respond to that? This is about vaccinations for, for presumably this is about vaccinations for COVID. I'm um, assuming that that is prioritizing housing because we're talking about homelessness. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. not. No, maybe I, it's about I vaccinations. I think it's maybe it's a conversation okay. yeah, about yeah, vaccinations. You're right. you're right. You know, we have um, this impossible problem going on right now and sort of pitting groups against other um, other groups. And the, the answer is there's no right answer. I, I have been really advocating, um, first of all, for an equity lens in our vaccination policies. We know that the death rates for, you know, Black folks in their 50s, you know, are from COVID are extraordinarily high. And I cannot get a vaccine, you know, because they're not 65. Um, that said, um, you know, we know that um, things like congregate shelters are hotbeds of infections, and it's hard to not prioritize um, those. But I think we're, um, you know, our vaccine system is sort of faced with all the same problems that we are. Hopefully that is going to 
Um, the supply is going to get better soon, but I think we shouldn't be having conversations about things like vaccine hesitancy and things without talking about vaccine equity. We're all going to get out of this COVID crisis faster if we get the vaccines to the people most impacted. Um, and that's just, that's just, you know, where we are. Uh, I've been told we get to time for one more question where we have a, we're going to uh, go over a little over our time, but not too much. Um, here's a question um, from Jane. Uh, GBH News reports today allegations of assault happening in an overnight shelter in Massachusetts. Why would an unsheltered person go to a shelter if safety is questionable? Uh, these are you know, horrible choices people experiencing homelessness face every day uh, to take their chances on the street or in an environment that feels unsafe, especially, especially for women. Um, you know, that would break your heart. Every, every woman experiencing homelessness I've ever spoken to tells stories of, of sexual abuse and uh, there's nowhere safe. That's why this is such a, a critical justice issue. Um, so we would like to sort of finalize this, this really important conversation, which I hope that everybody who's listening to it sees this as a launching off point, if you haven't already been absorbed with this, to give everybody a last um, sort of thought. Uh, we'll go around the room. Maybe, Howard, we could start with you. So, Jennifer, thank you again for moderating, and I want to thank my fellow panelists for this fascinating conversation you know, our country has gone through such a devastating year with COVID, but the only silver lining is that public health, which used to be invisible, is now very visible, and it's a term that's talked about every day. Uh, we all see what has happened when we don't think about improving our public health system and investing in it. And as part of that, uh, this issue uh, is very much a public health crisis because it's absolutely unacceptable for all the reasons that you've heard. So I'm hoping that starting uh, now, we, we can all commit to doing more to address uh, this crisis because it doesn't affect just some of us, it affects all of us. Uh, for all the reasons we've talked about, this risk of homelessness could get worse in the very near future. We are watching Congress debate this very important package but more critically, we need to talk about how we address these issues better together in a coordinated fashion across all sectors, not just the health sector, not just the housing sector, but across all sectors. Emphasize the health equity theme that's been mentioned prominently throughout this panel and keep the momentum going. And from the academic side, I hope we can contribute some more. So we're eager to work with all of you in the future. And so thanks so much again for making the time to uh, attend this very important session. Thanks so much, uh, Margo. You know, I think um, as Amanda said, you know, COVID did not, um, you know, did not change anything. It just sort of made more visible the ruptures in our society. And I think if there's one thing that the general public can learn from COVID is that we cannot have a healthy society until we have a just society and we cannot have a just society until we um, actually reckon with all the ways that racism has sort of cleaved our society in half. And so maybe if there's one thing to say is that, um, you know, we need to solve the housing crisis. We need to solve it in a way that um, is comes from a framework of housing and racial justice, and that this is actually going to advantage um, everybody, um, not, not just impacted communities. And I think COVID has made, in some ways, has just made that very painfully visible. So that's, that's what I hope we come out of this with. Thank you so much. Roseanne? I think it would be easy to leave this conversation feeling only despair. Uh, I hope people take away a sense of the urgency um, and, and how much is at stake. But also I would like folks to know that communities are making progress. Uh, of the 84 communities that we work with, more than half are reducing homelessness. 14 have ended chronic or veteran homelessness. There is a path to solving this problem. And I think to, you know, to reference Howard's point, um, in this moment where the country is reckoning with the need for a robust uh, public health system, and Margo's point that you know, a justice and equity has got to be at the heart of it, uh, we actually know what to do. It's about the will and, and leaning into what's working. 
very uh, important words. Jim? Uh, you know, one, I found that, find this discussion incredibly illuminating and provocative and uh, makes my mind go. And so in one way, I want to say thank you to everyone for that. Um, and if I would have a thought on all of this is I remember that um, we were stunned when the virus went raging through our shelter system in Boston. When um, they did the genomics on the virus, it was the exact same strain that had been at the Biogen conference, which was the original super spreader event. So if anything ever taught us from a public health and every other perspective that we're all in this together, it was right there. So rather than a blame the victim, I think this was one of the first times I've seen, seen people acknowledge this virus is it affects everybody and we need to protect ourselves. And the only other thing I'd leave is that one of our, um, one of the guys who lived on the streets forever, who, you know, is cantankerous and fun and, you know, lovable in every which way, um, was grumbling the other day when we saw him uh, outside his, his new home. And he said, the only silver lining about COVID is that now the rest of the world will understand how isolated and stigmatized we homeless people are. Um, and when I think of people dying alone in the hospital and all the stuff they're going through, that's what homeless people have been suffering through for all our lives. So there is a chance, I think, and I'm with Roseanne, I think there, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. And I think if we can, um, you know, if we can, if we can just keep ourselves together, solving the, these fundamental structural issues that need to be solved, we'll get, we'll get there. I love to hear the optimism in all the seriousness of this problem. And, and final words to you, Amanda. I agree with Roseanne. I have great hope. And my hope lies in the fact that we are finally able to have conversations, that there is no housing, racial justice without housing justice. We're finally able to th say things like our country is actually not broken, right? I hear people say all the time, this is not the America I know. This is the only America the black and brown people know. Systems designed for our oppression. And when we have those conversations, we actually get to start to uproot and dismantle those systems to get to the goals that we know we can get to. And that means housing for everyone, ending homelessness, ending the disparities we see. So I have great hope because we're living into the tensions of really difficult conversations uh, like we had here today. That's happening in communities. People are not shying away from that. And I would just ask you when you leave this space, think every day, am I decolon decolonizing myself as a gatekeeper? Am I disrupting the power that I have? So people with lived expertise, people closest to the ground and closest to the problem are at the table, not with a folding chair, but with a permanent chair, and then get to create their own spaces with the power that they rightfully deserve to make decisions about the policies that have been impacting them for years. Well, thank you so much, all of you. Uh, really incredible. I couldn't believe how much we got through in one hour. So uh, important. This concludes our event. The Q&A has been jointly presented by the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and GBH News. Thanks again.